Hello and welcome to the Click Wars podcast. Jamie, how you doing, man? I'm good. Thank you for tuning in. This week, we've got Nina Clapperton, the multi-six-figure travel blogger, private jet surfer, elite dog handler. Uh, great banter with Nina. She's always <laughs> great to talk to. She's uh, She talks a bit in depth about how travel bloggers are slightly different meta and how you can get ahead, how she's defending her positions in the travel surfs with real images, but also how she's using AI to get ahead and use cleverly because she was an early adopter of AI before it was cool. We also talk about different elements for prompts, whether she'd sell after achieving so much success. And uh, it was great for us to talk to, to Nina and I hope you enjoy it. If you want to check out any of me and Sammy stuff, we don't have any sponsors yet. If you're a sponsor, get on it. We'll make you loads of money because we have so many listeners of our, our brand new podcast. Sammy, if you want to learn about UK <laughs> personal finance, you should get on Sammy's newsletter at upthegames.co.uk. For me, I blog about affiliate marketing, SEO, niche sites and the like at increasing.com. You can go to increasing.com slash newsletter for the latest and greatest updates on that front every Thursday. I'm also the head of marketing at Lasso, the best affiliate marketing plugin in the world. We recently showed, according to the Niche Pursuits host, the incredible Jared Bauman, that we can increase your uh, earnings 88% over AAWP. So if you want to maximize your earnings, I suggest you get on that. But for now, let's chat to Nina. Hello, everyone. We've got Nina with us today the legendary travel blogger, one of the first winners of the 100k month challenge, destroying even the John Dykstra's and the other people in the game to hit new heights. So we're very grateful to have Nina here today. Um, I didn't mean to do your introduction for you. You know, you've got 20 seconds <laughs> to tell us everything that you can in most important order. Fire away. Uh, I love the color purple and my dog is my life. So those are the two most important things to know. <laughs> but I am also um, a multi six figure travel blogger and I run she knows SEO.co where I teach other people how to, yeah, do SEO without all the technical jargon. Um, I am a very chaotic person, so I don't know how to do this in 20 seconds and I'm panicking now, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, but I guess I'm Canadian. Um, I've lived in 18 countries in the last 10 years. And yeah, if that doesn't tell you how commitment phobic I am, nothing will. <laughs> That's a great intro. That's a great Thank intro. <laughs> it's a Friday evening. Um, so this one's going to be a more casual one. I'm not sure if we've done serious ones. It's going to be a chill one. Um, first thing I, I want to ask, you've smashed six figures in a month before. And um, how, like, how do you go from, I think you were obviously earning on a really high level. How do you then suddenly go to such like astronomical gains and how, how do you build the systems to be able to do that? And how, how, go on, give, give us the secret <laughs> skills. <laughs> Um, well, definitely. I joined the challenge with one site and I thought it would be, I don't know, like more pure or something to do just like one site in it and try mm -hmm. to get that site alone to 100K. And then when I realized I was so close with my full portfolio, I was like, well, for this month, let's just shove all of them in there. That's like I cheated a little bit at the end. I fully admit that. Um, but like, I mean, I was, yeah, I think I did 113K in the end. It was a little bit over that. I don't remember all the change off the top of my head. Um, and then that was with five sites, but really two sites were carrying it. And yeah, I genuinely, I'm still blown away by it. Um, a big thing that happened was I, for my main SEO course, I was going to raise the price. And so that Friday, I made 35K in a day, which I kept like tweeting about. And everyone was like, how is this happening? What's going on? And I am very much like I am my golden retriever. I didn't know until I got him how much of a golden retriever I am. But I was just like, I live alone and yelling at him. Oh, my God, Theo, like we're at this number. He doesn't care. So I needed someone else to care and to listen. So I kind of live tweeted the process by accident, I guess, because I was just like, what is happening? Um, so the main ways that I scaled was honestly just community building. I think that's the biggest thing is like I founded my SEO business a year and a half ago now um, and things have massively grown. But even with my blogs, like I didn't make money really with my blog until June of 2022. So it scaled a lot very, very quickly. And that's been amazing. But I think also building in public to build that trust in that community where I 
shared everything I've done wrong. I've talked about like the weird TikTok dances I tried to do to like go viral on TikTok. I've talked about my failed adventures on Pinterest. Like I'm not good at everything. And so I think being a real person and showing when I'm bad at stuff helps. Nice. And um, so you, uh, it was, it sounds like it's a lot of it was courses and you've also got services. And so I presume there was a lot of services that come in there as well. How do you build the systems for other people who are looking to like put out Thai services and stuff as well to be able to like, I guess, deliver that much to so many people at that scale? Like how, what goes into that? This is the funny thing is like, I don't have a team for that. It's just me for the service side of it. Cause I feel like if people are going to spend money on me doing something for them, they should get me. And I do have an editor that like handles my actual systems for my site. So I think the biggest thing is I stepped away from my own stuff to help other people instead. And I do sometimes regret that because like my favorite thing to do is to write. And I miss that I don't get to write as much anymore. Um, but because of that, it is really me handling things. And what I had to realize early on is I, at first, honestly, I was chasing money. I think most of us are like that, especially with like a business with services, like you want clients, any client will do, I'll take you, like, let's do this. And I had to realize like I needed to scale that back because I am one lady doing this by myself. Um, and especially with a lot of the services like coaching, people now message me for coaching like five times a day. I don't have that bandwidth. I'm, I've got other stuff to do. I have to like, I do try to spread myself out amongst all my things. So I think like if I'd had a plan at the start, that would have helped. And if I hadn't at first been so set on having the lowest price services available, like I was doing blog audits for 50 bucks. I was like, and that was like a like three hour blog audit. Like this was not a quick, like at a glance blog audit. Um, I was doing like in-depth coaching for $75. Like, cause I just, I kind of needed to prove it to myself that this was a real thing. And I think it, in the end it worked out to, build some trust, get some testimonials, but that was not the goal. It was literally the goal was just, I need to like prove my dad wrong, that this is a thing that will make me money. <laughs> um, and people always like tell me like, Nina, spite shouldn't drive you. I, I think spite is like the rocket fuel that has driven me. Like my family is very supportive, but equally they have no clue what's happening. They're like, what the fuck is she doing? How is she making money? <laughs> like every time I like, tell, like I'll do an income report online. My mom follows me on Instagram. My sister follows me and then tells my dad because he doesn't know how he has Instagram, but he can't log in. He's locked himself out probably for the best. Um, but every time they're like, is that real money? Like, oh, it's going to stop because they don't understand where it comes from. And I'm just like, hold my beer, fucking watch me. Like, watch how this works. Um, and that's, yeah, for me, that's been the really motivating thing with it. But my systems are really just like, limit the time of it to create scarcity, um, both because you need to protect your time, but also because like, it does work. I, that's the thing I've learned the most is every time I've had scarcity, whether or not I intended it, things massively blow up sales wise. So okay. Nina, obviously you've gone on this massive journey and you mentioned there, obviously June 22 is when it really kicked off for you. What was it like before that? Give us a bit of context, how long it took, maybe how many articles you were doing before you scaled to bring in a team. You mentioned you've got an editor now, like, what was that process like? Yeah, so I started my blog in October 2018, roughly, um, because I had done a year in Europe. And so I was like, let's just talk about it. Like my friends and family are tired of hearing about it. So I launched a blog, had no idea what I was doing, didn't know it could be monetized, to be honest. I thought like to monetize, you had to be on Instagram for travel. Like everyone on Instagram is like, oh, I get paid to stay at these beautiful hotels. And I was like, cool, I want that. But I didn't own a camera. So I was like, well, I write. Let's, like, I've been writing novels since I was 11, I think. Um, I think that's when I finished my first one. It was really bad. It was like the worst Twilight fan fiction you've ever seen in your life. But I was like, oh, I am peak literary. I am amazing. So um, because of that, I was like, I like writing. Let's try that. And then I moved to New Zealand because I was avoiding law school. I got a full scholarship and I was like, actually, let's take this $200 flight to New Zealand and move there instead. So I moved there and was just writing about what I was doing while I was there. And 
with that, I was looking at what other people were doing to succeed. And the main thing I saw people doing was those like weird Facebook, like you comment on mine, I'll comment on yours. You Google mine, I'll Google yours. I did not know what SEO was. I'd never heard of a keyword. And it was a few years before I knew what a keyword was. So I was just writing about random nonsense. And I was mostly trying to stick to like, publish on a schedule, you'll get a certain number of posts, things are going to go great for you. And I did manage to get up to 30,000 page views a month that way. But it was so synthetic. Like the second I took a week off, because like I got a job at the New Zealand Commerce Commission working as like an admin assistant, uh, just because I needed money, I had burnt through all of the money I had traveling for a month. So I was like, cool, let's get some cash at a temp agency. Um, and I, I didn't have time anymore to spend 80 to 120 hours a week on these stupid Facebook groups that were just dumb. Like anyone doing those please, today, stop doing them. Just get out of there because it's not a real audience. It's not actual people who care. And even if they're like spending three minutes on the page or whatever the rules are now, they're not going to buy anything from you. So like, you're not actually getting anything. So I would get sick. I would like be busy with work. Um, I moved to the UK because I was doing my master's there and I didn't have time to do these things. So it all fell apart and that sucked. And then I kept kind of telling myself like, well, one day it'll work, one day it'll work, whatever. But I was also only looking at like the surface level of what people who were succeeding were doing. So I'd like glance at Nomadic Matt's site and I'd be like, oh, well, I see these things. And I would just decide that they were working, whether or not they were. Like everyone in travel at some point, we have a booking.com widget in our sidebar because we see 20 other people doing it. And that widget, if anyone listening to this has ever gotten more than one booking off of that widget, I will be shocked. <laughs> like I would be so <laughs> surprised because there's no intent there. And on mobile, no one freaking sees it. So like yeah. it's just so useless. So I spent about five years just ruining things just like absolutely no i think my site had like 200 almost 200 posts just shy of it um some of them were like 500 words like what i'm most excited to do in singapore which like my mom and my grandma were the only people reading my blog at that point and my mom was with me in singapore beside me as i wrote that <laughs> post so i was like she doesn't even care she's here like what is happening <laughs> but i was very much in that like throw spaghetti at the wall phase of like, I started an email newsletter where I wrote the email that my grandmother still yells at me about to this day, which is I'm writing this to you from the ER because I had just like, I was literally on a hike. I forgot to send my email that day. Um, I wasn't wearing hiking boots, which is a no, no. It was just rained, like poured rain in Algonquin park. So I fell at the top of the trail and broke, almost broke my foot in the end. It turned out I had just splintered my foot. And then like my whole foot was like, I sprained like, the actual oh, foot, not my ankle. Yeah. Whoa. So I wrote, so I wrote an email about that as I sat in the emergency room and had to told my ready. family. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, she's a very scary, like 90 year old Russian woman. So I just get a call in like, and I can't do her accent, but in the deepest Russian <laughs> accent of like, just Ber like berating me like what why would you do this to your poor grandmother like you're gonna like you're gonna murder me with the fear of it and I was like I am so sorry I forgot you read this like oh no but like that was I was just doing anything to see if it would work and none of it worked and then so when, I learned about SEO click? oh yeah so it was January 2021 I learned about SEO heard the word for the first time took a course only watched one lesson of it and decided, I know what keywords are now. Like I am superior or whatever. And this is why I tell people, you don't know what you don't know <laughs> because I didn't know anything. Um, so then I was just going after like low volume keywords about anything for a year basically. And then it was November, 2021 where I was like, okay, my whole family was like, dude, you've got to stop this. Like you have to get out of this and just, actually get a job that's legitimate. And I was working for jobs at the time, like trying to please everybody, um, but also trying to pay off debt from getting a service dog. They're so stupidly expensive for the training. Um, like I was like 50K in debt, like it was bad uh, just for this dog. And so for me, it was like, I need to prove to my family and I need to prove to myself that I don't need to go to law school. So I told myself like by the end of 2022, 
I needed to be making at least $2,000 a month from my blog, which is like kind of what I thought was the upper level you could make. Um, I didn't think you could really go beyond that because no one talked openly about the money they were making. So I was like, need something. Um, and then I sat down in December and just like wrote out a plan for myself and enacted it really quickly. And that's like things took off in six months. I was in Mediavine uh, six weeks later. I had finally put affiliate links on my blog that were like legitimate for the first time ever. And I hit 10K a month um, and then things spiraled. And by January, I had my first 30K month. Nice. Wow. And so this one's a bit of like a toxic hustle, hustle question. But so you met like... um. You mentioned on, like, I remember a tweet that was when the 100K one thing was going, like, oh, don't make me get competitive because I was doing 80 hours at law and, and doing this stuff and I was still finding the time to do this. Now, law is a pretty, like, cognitive intense. It's not, you can't just sit and just like, oh, whatever, it's just law, right? Like, you have to concentrate. And so that will take your, your mind's energy up, unless you're about to tell me that it's not, but I, that's, that's what it's <laughs> like in my mind, right? So how do you, and again, I'm, I'm bringing out, like, the, toxic work all the time whatever thing here but i think it is relevant for the side hustlers out there like how what was your strategy to be able to still be productive to maintain enough cognitive focus to be able to still be productive and drive results whilst having other commitments that a lot of other people have yeah i think for me law wasn't because i was just a law clerk so i wasn't like I say just, that's still an intense job for sure. But for me, everyone, (laughs) (laughs) but like, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) I can promise you it's not as intense as that. But like, I I was working at like a small firm that did estate law. Um, So we were mostly doing like will signings, writing wills, drafting contracts. Everyone at my firm was like over 50 and couldn't type. So they'd be like, okay, give Nina the will because she'll get it done in 10 minutes. But it would take them like, three hours to do it. So for me, like, because I knew how to like command F and like just auto insert things that they had no idea about. So for me, it didn't, it didn't actually use up that muscle, I guess, for me. And as well, like I was working from home, which I think is a very beneficial thing. If I was in an office, when I was in New Zealand in the office, I did find it much harder. But I do also, I think because I hyper focus with my ADD, like I can just drive myself so intensely for a bit and then I will crash but I know that like I've got this much focus I can give to things and if I have eight hours a day of focus I'm gonna cram like that's how I did I did four jobs and I was working maybe 60 hours a week and like the law clerk thing was full-time but I would find ways to multitask so if I'm on a will signing for somebody when people in Canada when you sign a will you have to have uh, like the lawyer present and a witness and because we did them for people who were very old during COVID especially um, I would just be a zoom witness which was became allowed which we didn't have before but you legally have to explain the whole will to them all like 29 pages of everything so I just be like mute write a blog post as they're doing that Um, (laughs) which I think is hard for a lot of people because they can't like write and type and I'm not great at that either. So that's where AI came in for me. Like I've been using AI writers since November, 2021. So right around the time that like, I think actually I tried it in October, but I bought it in November cause there was like the black Friday sale or something. Um, I am, I'm a slut for a black Friday sale. I'm so excited <laughs> whenever things are on sale. I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, it's also why I am addicted to AppSumo. Like I have, I have a problem yeah. with AppSumo. <laughs> <laughs> I think all three of us can take that box. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but so it was really was just gonna... like finding moments for myself. When I had a spare moment, I would go for it. And when I did my, I did a master's in publishing media, like for physical books, and you would be surprised how none of it transfers over. Like it was a waste of my time and money considering what I do now, but I thought I wanted to be a book editor. But one of my profs told me, she's like, I wrote my book in 15 minute intervals, waiting to pick up my kids from like soccer practice and things. And I was like, if she can do a book that way, I can, I can do other stuff like that. I don't know. So I think yeah, just challenge yourself. And then to some extent, like take time off, give your brain a break. What what I take from that is that I see across like anyone who's really successful and that have done this, you know, we all like started by like putting in the time and hours and the grit and determination it takes to do this because it is a slog and you got to keep going. And that's like one of the main things that I took from what you said there. I love that. So you mentioned AI. Big conversation, big, big <laughs> conversation, but you're, you're, you know, you're a big advocate of it. And, and 
I'd love to know, you know, how you found this process. You mentioned 2021s when you first started out. Like, what's your what what was it like then, and and sort of how have you how do you sort of integrate it into your systems these days? Yeah, I used to be afraid to talk about it, and I actually like one of the first big podcast interviews I ever did. I like asked not to talk about it because I was really afraid. Like back then, people like jumped down your throat if you were using it, and they were like, "Oh, Google's gonna get you." And I was like, "All oh, my best articles are written by AI. Chill." So for me, it's it's been the same workflow for a lot of it. Is like work with it. Don't make it do everything for you. And it's always funny to me that like people who are anti AI have one of two camps. They're either it's coming for my job. It can do everything I can or they're mad that it can't do everything they can and they still have to do the work. And I've been very much in the middle where I'm like, it is a tool like a calculator just to help you speed things up. And like, could you do all those like functions yourself? Yeah. Do you want to? No. <laughs> like I, I have no desire to, like, to become a graphing calculator of a person. That sounds terrible to me. And so with this, like it, it just speeds it up, but it's really on you. And so I also find like the most important part of writing for me is the research. I want yeah. to take that time to provide the most valuable content. And I couldn't do that if I was like when I was working the four jobs, one of the jobs was doing 40,000 words a week for um, a legal blog, which was like all about elder abuse and the worst job I've ever done. It was just like, so I would like call my grandma every week. Like, are you okay? I'm just, <laughs> I just need to check in with you. But like it, it paid the bills. I needed, I needed money desperately. Um, right. But when I was doing that and trying to work for me, like, yeah, writing saps your creative juices and, and I'm definitely a perfectionist of those little words. And so AI can get you going and then you just edit it. You work with it. I've always said, treat it like a like little baby intern. Who's like just showed up first day. doesn't really know what's happening. Um, so like be kind to it, but it can't do what you do. You have to feed it the information. You have to do prompt engineering. You have to be willing to adjust it. And if you're not willing to edit it, then like, why are you then just hire writers? Like, why are you doing this? Or hire an editor. Like there's a huge influx now in our industry of people hiring editors just to edit AI content because it's not good enough to just like hit one click and publish it. Yeah. What's your one prompt that you're using that no one knows about, but they should know about it. Oh, I have so many. Okay. Or just tell us all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one that I really love is like defining your style. And I feel like a lot of people aren't doing that. So like give it your tone of voice, give it your site and have it like train it on you. Be like, this is like an ideal blog post piece I've written. What should I tell you for you to write it at this caliber? What should I tell you for you to do this for me? And so you can just say, define this as Nina's style and then like write in Nina's style. But you can also like break it down with chat GPT and be like, explain to me how, like how this was written. Explain to me the structure, explain like all of those details, the tone of voice. And then you've got the basis of how it should do things. There's another one that I really love is like, I'll give it a piece of my own content and be like, what can I improve? And just like be willing to get that feedback. Um, it will tell you things that I love. And then a the last one is people hate secondary keywords. And I don't know why, because they're so good. But people are like, when they first write a post, they're like, I just want to put one keyword in, publish it, we're done. And then when I update it, I'll add like the 20 secondary keywords do it first, like put it in now. And so what I'll do is I'll give it my piece and then I'll actually give it like, okay, chat GPT, read this piece. And you can do that in whatever way you want. You can give it a link if you're using GPT-4 or you can copy and paste it in on GPT-3.5 or whatever AI you're using. Um, and then you can say, here's a list of secondary keywords. Add these secondary keywords to the piece above without like changing current sentences, like add new sentences. And it'll add all of your secondary keywords for you so that you don't have to. And the reason that I make it not adjust the piece is like, I've already been careful about the primary keyword. So if I've added it, I don't know, 10 times, let's say, which might be a bit much, but if the secondary keyword would replace one of those times, that can be an issue. You don't want to like undo stuff. Um, 
and yeah, so that's a way to quickly add things that you don't want to do. So I find it a great, like, treat it like an assistant. It does all the little things that you don't want to do. Nice. With um, your travel book, sorry, Jay, I was just going to say, like, how you've obviously, um, images that play a massive factor in what you do. How are you finding, and are you seeing uh, other travel bloggers starting to integrate AI imagery into their work? Like it means that they don't have to scale that mountain or get that wonderful shot in front of that beautiful <laughs> spot. They don't have to anymore, right? And like, are you seeing that at all? It's not big in travel yet, which is kind of nice. Like I think because people don't know the prompts to make it show them like not like a lot of travel or a lot of AI images just want to do a profile of a pic of a person if you tell them like write it or do a photo about this person so I'm not seeing a ton of it what I see way more is people trying to like game the system by taking a photo that's stock putting it into canva adjusting the saturation like one percent or something and thinking that's enough um, so people like are doing all the other workarounds they can do to try and like fake an original image as best they can I'm not seeing a ton of AI yet. And I think that's partially because it's not as good at doing like really hyper specific landmarks that aren't like the Eiffel Tower, like something very common and well known. It's not as good about the, I don't know, a street on in downtown Victoria, BC. Like it just doesn't know that well enough. I think we will start to see it eventually. Um, but I also think users don't love the idea of something that's not like of anything that looks like painted and things like that. It doesn't work as well for us. And a lot of AI that like AI images that look good have like that slightly, I don't know, almost like the uncanny valley to them a little bit. Yeah. So I think count. you have to be really careful. You're right. Like they don't, they still have that glow, don't they? At the moment, it's just got that tiny little bit and you can really see it, but I can see that changing really, really quickly. And I suppose that means that anyone could create a blog and say that they've been to New Zealand and do these things. It's, it is scary. Like the way, the way you think about it, do you, do you feel like that's far off for you? And do you think you'd expand into other countries and try those things? I don't think I would. I think because like I've got enough personal information about so many to throw it in there. Like I think I, I chose two pillars when I like niche down from just doing freaking everything. Um, and I thought I would do them for a month and it's been a year and a half, I guess now, and I'm just over and I'm still doing them. I haven't exhausted either of them. So I don't see myself needing to go in that direction. But I think the big thing is when you're reading a travel blog that is it's clear someone hasn't been there. They can post as many photos of it as they want. They could, like Even if you went there and just took the photos, it can be quite different in terms of the helpful content. So when you see like, okay, um, I don't know, someone talking about going to, like I grew up in Toronto, so people will be like, oh, the best thing to do is the CN Tower, go at this time for short lines. And it's like, no, the right answer is don't go because it's dumb. Here are like six other vistas you can go to that are like way better. Or like, yeah, just tell, telling them like those little extra details of like, oh, and like parking downtown is a nightmare. So don't drive. Or if you do drive, there's this one like lot that is five bucks cheaper than all the others. AI is not going to teach you that research can kind of get you there. But ultimately, I think personal experience does show and I can even tell in my own posts, like if I am, if I generate something about a place that I went to for half a day versus somewhere that I spent some time in, I can look at it and be like, I, I feel the difference. Like, and I'll even go to that place later and update it. And I'm like, wow, okay. Like I did so much research, but it just doesn't replace you being there and doing the thing. It's so the yeah, like I can feel, isn't it? It's that like, yeah. kind of, it's that nitty gritty that you're just never going to get from an AI. And I, and I think like, there's always the fear of it, but to some extent, like we can fear everything. I mean, I have generalized anxiety disorder. If I look at like a wall of cheese at the grocery store, I panic because I'm like, ah, decisions. So <laughs> like, I panic about everything. I just, I don't have it left in me to panic about AI, I guess. And I think there's always workarounds and like they need people, they need us and they'll find a way to fit us in. And we just have to adapt or die sort of a thing, but like they don't want us to die or they're going to die. That leads very well onto a question I have. Um, 
you mentioned the, that even if you've been somewhere half a day versus a much longer time, you can hear the difference in the tone of voice, in the quality of the content, in the depth, in the way that you talk about it. Um, so I wanted to ask about whether in travel, there's a different meta to, I guess, I want to say normal, because it's not not normal to go traveling, right? But like, th is there a difference in how we perceive like helpful content in travel versus other things? Is there any tweaks, any different ways of writing intros? What's, is the, is the meta different for travel versus everything else? And what are those tweaks that you need to do for Google, for users, for everything else that gets you there? So I think travel is a little bit different than other niches. Like I do have, I have five sites now, and I think there is a fair difference between them. And travel is definitely for me, the hardest niche because number one, like just like pets, people write about what they like. So then people get into that first. But I think also a big thing for travel is actually cutting yourself down to include that extra information without telling massive stories. Cause I think that's what a lot of people want to do in travel is like, oh, okay, like, yeah, this parking lot's $5 cheaper, but they're going to tell you that in a thousand words about how they like drove around and like couldn't find parking and they screamed at their partner and now they're getting a divorce and like, it's all because of a parking lot. And it's like, it's, it's fault. And it's the worst thing in the world. And you're just like, okay, I just wanted to know where to park. Like I did not need that. Like that's a newsletter to me. And I think that's a big difference. Then I think also the big thing for travel that people don't get, and like, Jamie, I love your Spear framework for intros. It's the one that I use. I train my writers on. I think it's, I even actually, I train ChatGPT on it. So it does it for me when Ooh, I do intros. Speaking of that, um, something's yes. coming. <laughs> I'm so I'm honestly so excited. Um, I'm like a kid at Christmas. I'm like, ah, it's like getting updated. Yay. <laughs> um, but I think also like the experience versus expertise. That's the hard thing for people because in other niches, like you're a doctor, your expertise is you're a doctor, your experience is you did that surgery. With travel, we have to figure out a way to say experience versus expertise because they are different. And the expertise is like you could have solo traveled for a million years. For me, like I've lived in 18 countries. That's my expertise with like living abroad, things like that. My experience would be like, have I lived in that country? How long did I live in that country? And getting really specific. A lot of travel bloggers fear saying that I was there for a week. I actually trust that more to some extent than like, like I grew up in Toronto. I hate Toronto <laughs> because like, because I grew up there. And so like, I don't know, I associate it with school. Like I didn't go to like the CN Tower regularly. I went like once or twice. My sister shoved me onto the glass floor. So now I hate it there um, because that was terrifying. And little sisters <laughs> are bigger bullies than big sisters. I maintain that to my core. <laughs> but also like I spent so much time there just living there, which is so different than visiting. And I would honestly, like I don't write a lot about Toronto because I tell people, listen to the people who just visited. And so getting specific in your meta in, in saying like, I was there for a week, I was there for a week in 2021. That's okay. It doesn't date your piece. It doesn't invalidate your experience. If anything, I would trust that more than someone reading my site and me saying, um, yeah, go to this donut shop because I lived here for 18 years what? Like, okay, that doesn't matter to me. Did you go to the donut shop? Did you actually experience the thing? So I think that's the big difference for travel versus other niches. Nice. And um, so I found, I'm not going to mention anything like this, but obviously you've got a lot of links going from the two sites. And so I had a quick look at the keywords. And mm -hmm. so you're ranking for a lot of the same type. I won't name the type because I don't want to put any, Thank you. <laughs> any, you know, whatever. How, what's your plan now you rank for a lot of these keywords to defend them? You've got these great rankings. You've got traffic coming in like crazy. Ahrefs shows this to people. How are you going to stay one step ahead of everyone, keep optimizing that and stay ahead of the pack as that comes in, as bigger people notice, oh, they're getting a thousand here and a thousand there. What's your way of not just getting there, but maintaining it? Yeah, I think the big thing for me is backlinks. Honestly, backlinks and then epic content. Like I really think I always used to say when it was EEA or EAT now it's EEAT which sucks but like I was like you have to eat the competition and it's true and like this is again I think spite wins out like be spiteful be a petty bitch it's great because you can be like okay they're ranking they're good people are going to come after you like I do 
I share my sites with my paid students because like, why not? And to some extent, like, it's really funny, but like, I, I rank for like niche site lady travel blogs. So I think people are always like, are you her? And I'm like, no, like she's, she's doing way better than I am. Like, that, and I'm not British. Like I would love to be, but I'm not. I've got this like sad Stick Canadian accent. Your ego. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I could do even a fake British accent, I would live in that accent. Let's be real. Like I am a nightmare that way. <laughs> but instead I, instead I say sorry and a boat and things like that. And I sound the most Canadian ever. <laughs> so no, unfortunately, that's not me. I'm also terrified of kids. And she I believe she has kids. So like, wouldn't work out. But like, I think it's, I've, I've actually forgotten the question now, to be honest with Don't you. Worry, started fine. laughing about that. Oh, oh, the keywords. So the way I defend keywords is, I just make really good content. And then also, like, I do build backlinks to it. And I think a lot of people, there's always like those people who are like, just attract them, just attract them. And I'm like, cool that's what people say about like dating too. And like, there's a reason I've been single for a number of years. Cause I can attract all I want, but like, they're not coming. My magnet is clearly like faced the wrong way or something. Um, and so like you have to put yourself out there and do the stuff. And I think early on, especially getting those backlinks, um, one of my main posts that brings in like over 12,000 page views a month, first of all, not a great one for ad revenue, terrible for affiliates so to some extent i'm like cool come after them you don't know which ones are doing best and it's always mm-hmm. funny to me um but i do have like it's also funny to me because i'll do stu- like a blog audits for students and i'll see that they've tried to copy my keywords <laughs> and i laugh because they get stuck below me just because like they're trying to take an easy route and there's no easy route if you can outrank me because you made better content fair's fair well done like you deserve that but I have the topical authority in my niche. I have hundreds of articles on this topic. Um, I internal link really well. I build the backlinks. I know how to direct the backlinks through my site. And yeah, and to some extent, I like the competition. Like I, I want to compete. I want to update my articles. I want to get better. So I don't mind. I'm like, let's, I don't know, go for it. Like, let, let's fight it out. Let's have some fun on like the first page of Google, kind of like, Jamie, aren't you fighting somebody soon or something? Like, are you supposed <laughs> to be doing a cage match or something on Twitter? I would do it. I would do it. I, I've been challenged in the DMs. That's a workout. But I want to leech clout of famous people. I don't want to fight an SEO. I want to fa- fight on a famous person. <laughs> <laughs> you should like you could be like the like middleman between like Elon and um and Zuckerberg and just be like in the corner like yeah I'm gonna come in and like swipe both of them at the knees <laughs> I said I was gonna be the ring girl as well so uh, this needs to happen <laughs> I love it <laughs> <laughs> Nidhi you mentioned about um like how you direct backlinks and I think that's the conversation that Barely. I, in fact, I don't think I've ever heard that really on a podcast before. So w- what does that actually mean to you? Yeah, so I treat everything on my site like a funnel, like like a sales funnel. And so I direct backlinks the same way I direct the customer journey. Like if someone comes in from an informational article, I want to move them through my site to a converting article that's going to be like in the... Everyone has different names for it. There's like the AIDA, there's the conversion buying funnel, whatever. I want them at like the little tip of the funnel. The tip is the best part. Men always say that too. So let's go and like go for it. Um, I don't know. (laughs) I'm I'm a lesbian, so I'm not sure what men are into, but like that's from my vague, like, I don't know, attempts with men. That was my understanding. Um, So like we want to get them there. And it's the same thing for backlinks is like when you get a backlink to your site, the like the visual I always use for it. I love analogies. I think they're super fun and just like break it down. But there was a TikTok trend for a while where someone had like a giant bucket of water in their lap. Mm. And then the person behind them had a smaller bucket. It got like eight people back. The last person had a cup. And you would just like toss that bucket behind you. It was always freezing water because why would we ever have a trend where someone is not like getting aggressively attacked by <laughs> something? Um, <laughs> but, it, but it got smaller and smaller as you went back. But the same thing kind of happens with backlinks. Like it doesn't stop at that first page on your site. It moves through your site. And that's why internal linking is so important. Like I just make up metrics for how it breaks down. We don't know 100% of the time like what the percents are. But essentially, if that first page on your site gets the link, let's say it gets 100% of that backlink juice, then anything you link to from that page gets like 50%. 
So each of those links is getting that second seat in this like weird TikTok train. And so as you continue to internal link through your site, you're spilling that like, I know link juice, we all hate the term, but like it does work for this analogy, unfortunately. So you're spilling that like link juice through your site and moving it through. And a lot of people struggle to get backlinks to things like affiliate posts or like really hyper specific stuff. And this is one of the ways you do that. If that first page is super general, anything you link to it, yeah, it's 50%, maybe the next one is 25%, but 50% of a backlink is better than no backlink. And it's something I do as well, where like I will build backlinks to my silo pages, which are just like a page with a list of all the links for that category, because they can carry authority and then they can pass a link to every single one of those links on that page. So rather than building a link to a post that has, I don't know, 10 internal links in it, that silo page has a hundred on it. And so, yes, there's all that, like everyone says like, oh, it diminishes as you go. I can't speak to that. What I can speak to is that when I have that silo page and I will build links to it like it is a post on my site, all of those posts get some benefit. And that's really, really nice to have more of an impact from doing less. It's also why the posts on your site with the most backlinks to them should be the posts with the most internal links to pass that through to other things on your site. So you're not just like, I don't know, someone comes to your site, they like hit a post and then it's just a dead wall. Like, okay, we're done, get out of here. I want it to be like, and this is why I named my, my course, the SEO roadmap. I wanna take Google on a road trip through my site to get it from point A to point B to point Z, whatever, and just move it through as best I can, where most people worry so much about the start of that trip. Like they're just worried about packing and getting in the car. I want to like get to the end of that trip, get home, unpack, everything's great. The house is clean. I've like vacuumed the house now. I put the clothes in the wash. Like I want to finish the trip strong. And I think viewing your site and SEO holistically like that really benefits you the most. Like zoom out. We spend so much time zooming into like each post, each keyword needs to be perfect. But if they don't fit together with everything else, that one little puzzle piece could be beautiful. But if it's thrown halfway across the room from the puzzle, <laughs> how is it like, how is the puzzle getting done? I mean, that's how my dog finds it and eats it. And we end up at the emergency vet. And that's not my, <laughs> that's not my idea of a good day. So not what I want to do. So no one naturally links to an affiliate post, especially if it's an exact match anchor, right? And so like, you're doing the right thing by going before. Also, I was talking to Charles Float. And he talks about how, like, um, if you get a penalized dodgy link that you've been buying, and like, let's be real, we all buy like, fucking loads of links. And so if you buy a link and you get like the dodgy one in there, if you go to a page before, you can get that page hit, the informational one, but it won't pass the hit over to the next page that you've linked to. So you kind of insulate yourself with the paid links as well. Just for anyone who's listening in case they want to find that uh, useful to go through. Uh, I fully agree with that strategy. Not only is it natural, like uh, someone, some people create stats pages and then don't internally link to anything. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, <laughs> and also like, it's a way of looking more natural, a way of packing more links in without arousing suspicion. I think that you, that's a really good strategy that I'm glad that you mentioned, because I think that's helpful to a lot of people. Yeah, massively. I will say I've never bought links. <laughs> so I think I am in the minority there. Like I, I bought like- stay uh, away. <laughs> Like I always see people that they're like, yeah, I found like 200 links for like $10 on Fiverr. And I'm like, that, well, that one's bad. Ru I can tell you to run from that one. <laughs> so what do you do? I, I do guest posting. That's my big thing. And so I'm actually currently running a case study. We're in month four, but I want to do six months of it of like, I paid a Haro link builder to like actually do like the, I don't know. I've never bought just like a pack of links, but I have admittedly, I have paid for this um, to buy. So I bought like five backlinks for a site. And then for another site, I built uh, links via three guest posts and I've been competing against them to see. And it kind of sucked because I had to stop doing any other backlink building. So they're both kind of slightly stalled. Also, I have five sites, biggest mistake of my life. I do not have time for any of these things. Um, and so those ones have kind of installed as I do that. And I've been tracking the effects of like the DA 90 or 80 Haro links versus just three guest posts in my niche to like DA 40, 30 to 40 ish sites. Um, and yeah, we're kind of, we're a few months in. Haro was not doing well to begin with. Like it was, it took so long. Um, guest posting had a very, like it took a month and then the effects were starting. Um, and oh, wow. so far, like I can't say 
the end of it yet because I don't know. This is why I like running like three to six month case studies. Um, I've just finished up my third month of Raptive versus Mediavine because I couldn't, I didn't find any data of like which one's better. So I was like, let's create the data. Let's do it. Um, nice. And yeah. And so for me with like, with Haro versus guest posting, guest posting, like it cost me about a thousand dollars per, or a little bit under 750 per link with Haro. With guest posting, I did three guest posts. It took me like an hour and a half total to do all of them because I don't have to do the formatting and I hate formatting. That's what takes me a long time. I can like, because I used to write my novels by hand. So I write so fast, even without AI. And I will say like, if you're doing guest posts, if someone tells you not to do AI, please respect that. Like it's their site. I totally understand that. Like I am very pro AI equally. I'm pro boundaries. So if someone has like, don't, don't do this, just respect it. Or if that's like a boundary for you, don't do that guest post, go somewhere else. Um, but yeah, so I did three of those. You get about three to four links per, and it did so much better. And you can find those, like a lot of people, travel admittedly is a great niche for guest posting. Go on Facebook, search guest post and the word travel, or just like even collab and see the word travel. Um, I don't like collab posts. They don't, it takes the, the ROI is so much poorer than guest posting. Same for like link swaps. Guest posts just get you the most and the fastest. Um, so far, we'll see in month six with the Haro thing. Um, but yeah, I just pitch guest posts and I write those. I also will like pitch them to people who I know are in Mediavine or AdThrive. You can just like search for their site and then for um, find a snippet in the privacy policy of Mediavine or AdThrive and you can find all the sites on them. Um, so I do that all the time. And then just, if you also add the word guest post, you'll find all the sites there that allow guest posting. And then, well, sometimes it says no guest posting. Again, respect boundaries. <laughs> like they'll just delete your stuff. But guest posting for me as well, when I started, that's how I learned how to write well, like write for blogs versus writing a novel. Cause no one wants to read a novel style blog. Like that, that's when they delete your site from like their search history and run away from you. <laughs> if you're like, if your whole thing is giant paragraphs, they're out of there. So I learned from these bloggers. I got tons of networking too, especially before I could afford to go to conferences and things. And during COVID when you couldn't do that anyway, but like some of my best friends in blogging, I met through guest posting on their site or from like collaborating on things like that. So I think it's also such a good thing for that. Now, for people who want to buy stuff, hire someone to guest post for you. It's going to be more organic. It's also going to be so much cheaper. Like, I don't know, you hire a writer for a hundred bucks to write that guest post versus seven fifty for one link. You're going to get three or four links out of it, and like that's kind of including the time that you're likely to spend on them looking for these opportunities. But there's so many opportunities out there. Do you go back to the same sites again when you've got a topic that might be relevant for that blog or is it just like one guest post per site? How are you sort of structuring those? So I've yet to need to go back to one because there's just so many others out there and I do like to diversify it a bit. I would say like when I used to do collab posts, because I did do a comparison as well, of like collab posts versus guest posts. I'm just always testing stuff. I think it's just fun Love to it. do. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, but like it took about eight collab posts to get me nearly as much as one guest post. And eight collab posts, they're about 250 per post, uh, 250 words, you get one link. So that's about 2000 words. I could write a 2000 word guest post in that time, get three links and it did more. And typically it's easier because you're like in the flow of it. But yeah, for posts, I don't think I've ever had to go back. Um, but when I did, my rule was like six months between it. Just that way it is more of a space. I also always track this stuff, like keep it in a spreadsheet somewhere. I'm such a spreadsheet girl. I, like, I have like multiple Google Drive accounts just for all my spreadsheets because I refuse to pay Google to like upgrade the storage. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we'll have like, she knows SEO one at gmail.com, 1287, <laughs> just that way I can have the different ones. Um, but in there, like you keep, keep the name of what you did as well. That way you don't redo it. Like I, I do think it's okay to write it for yourself or write it for someone else after a year or two. Cause like by then that person should be updating the post. Things will have changed. Um, but you don't want Google to be like, okay, you just like, 
this is the analogy again i always do analogies but it's like if someone is like constantly telling you like subway is like the place to eat fresh go get a five dollar foot long over and over and over again you're like shut up like i don't care <laughs> or like same for like recommending a friend you're like okay well you're just recommending your friend you're biased whereas if they do it one time or like two times it has more of an impact so i think it's that kind of an idea of like the same way of someone recommending something to you if they're always saying like, okay, well, Nina, 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 you're like, get away from me. <laughs> like, I, do, I, I don't care anymore. It definitely has more of an impact when it's diluted and when you do it once or twice. That being said, um, I, can, I can see how someone might do it more often, especially if you're getting paid to like write for them. I have writers now, I'm doing another test of writers versus AI writers. Um, so far, AI is winning, to be honest with you guys. Um, but some of that is because early on, I was very bad at training these writers. I thought hire them and then leave and fuck off to the woods and like hope that they just do a good job. <laughs> That's not how you manage people, it turns out. Um, and I got a bollocking from my mom and my business manager who were like, what? <laughs> Don't do that. Like, call, Go to a river and call us when you can get some service because like we need to fix this. So yeah, I wouldn't. But also I think keeping track of it's good because if you ever change those pages, people are always like, I need to like, I want to change the URL of this page, but I'll lose the backlinks. You can message those people then if you have a clear record of it. Cause like, yes, Ahrefs will try to tell you it misses stuff. Like it is, it does its best. It's going to miss stuff. And if you have that record where you also have their contact information, your VA can like contact them in a second. Cause they don't want a broken link either. And even the redirect, sometimes that gets picked up as a broken link. So like, yeah, just tell them, be like, hey, and I've done it a million times because I my early site was, it was embarrassing. Like it was <laughs> like teenage puberty pics embarrassing. <laughs> it was bad. Like my twilight vampire phase where I didn't go outside for two <laughs> years and I was like full emo, full goth kid, only eyeliner under my eye. That was <laughs> less embarrassing than early, like my early sites. It was bad. So <laughs> like, um, yeah, so I think that's a good way to, to to keep control of it to some extent and to like not lose the benefit if you have to restructure down the line. Nice. Who, who do you look up to? Who's someone that like, you know, you've come all this way, incredible results. And like, who are you learning from right now? Oh my God, everybody. And I think that's the important thing is like just be open to absolutely everyone. Jamie is a huge inspiration to me where like I learned so much. Any podcast Jamie's on, I'm listening to it, 100%. Um, niche me site too, lady. Don't do that, yeah. please. <laughs> we'll, we'll get him a big head, yeah. <laughs> Make sure he's like, we'll, we'll just like drown him in beer so he blacks out and forgets we said this. Exactly. <laughs> like, I should have got some more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but like niche site lady, I love niche pursuits. I learn a lot from niche pursuits. Um, SEO Twitter, like, honestly, I, I literally, I'm taking September off. So I scheduled an email where I was like, here are some people I'm learning from. And it was 10 pages long. Like I had to cut it down to a full page of just the name of people and a hyperlink to where I've like, where they are, because I think learning is the most important. And like, also being open to the fact that like, you don't know everything. Like I've had students correct me on stuff or be like, Hey, what about this? And I'll go and learn about it. Cause I think if you're not willing to learn and adapt, like you're stuck, you're just going to die. And oh, yeah. it, you just need to be open to that. So genuinely I learn from everybody around me. And I think that's the best thing to do. So like Jared Ballman, Jamie, niche site lady, uh, Joe campus, um, niche site twins, both of them, obviously, cause there's two, um, <laughs> Jackie, <Do>. Chu, Cho. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like everybody, I mean, I have friends as well, like, and I'm very much as well community over competition. One of my best friends also runs a travel SEO, like course as well and people would be like oh like nina and laura would hate each other she's of like scale your travel blog and i was like no we've taken each other's courses to learn more because like she's has a very different approach than i do and i think that's amazing like i'm speaking at her conference soon because she was like please come even though again technically we could be seen as competitors and we'll send each other like hey have you heard of this this is a great thing she told me about web stories coming back i told her about calculators and like everyone there's room for everybody so be open to learning and be open to sharing your information too because like the second i started sharing my business does a lot better because i talk about stuff and because yeah. 
like because I share that. And that's how my business was founded is I just spent all my time in Facebook groups giving SEO tips once things started working for me. And people were like, hey, could I hire you? And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I don't know what to do with that. And then that's, to, to be honest, that's also how the shitty pricing strategy started, but like do better than that, <laughs> but be open to it. And yeah, it kind of like started my, I have like this Costco free sample policy because I went to Costco a year ago for the first time and it blew my mind um, because I love a freebie and I love bulk. I think it's amazing. But I went there and I was like, yeah, like they give away a freebie so you can try it before you get the 800 box of egg rolls try an egg roll first so you know you like it. And I think the same thing is like teach your students so they have some, like they know your stuff works. Cause I actually had a student um, who was a bit upset and was like, you give away so much. You're like undervaluing your course for those of us in it. And I literally said, I'm like, I'm not gonna stop because this is like, this is what I want to do. This is how I do it. And I think that's an important thing to know. And I've seen people as well, like, watching people out there grow. Alex Hermosi just did his like massive thingamajig, which like, unfortunately I liked him before. And the problem is if something is too popular, my brain just shuts down and is like, you cannot engage with that until people <laughs> stop talking about it. So like, I can't even, I was excited for the book and I like, my brain is like, you can't read it now. You have to be a rebel. You have to wait, <laughs> which is dumb, but like, that's- I'm halfway through the video yeah. of it. It's, oh, yeah? it is good. Yeah, no, it's great. Okay. Cause it, I can do video. I don't know if I could do the book. I think it, I'd drown out, but it's, it's worth it. It is actually worth it. I've, I've okay. picked up loads. Um, very good on the funnel side of stuff, uh, which I know okay. you, you're into. So, yeah, give, give the videos a whirl because they're easier to listen to. It. And he does like video presentations and stuff as well. So, it's, yeah. It's, okay, awesome. It's yeah, Which I agree. Cool. He's, 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 he, I, I do that too. I literally do that too. I'm like, it's popular right now, so fuck off. I'm gonna wait for it to come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When when nobody's nobody thinks this is cool anymore, and then I slide in. I do it with musicians all the time, like big bands and mates. Like, you have mm. to listen to this rap album. I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. It's, it's shit. It's shit. And then two years later, I'm like the biggest fan at front row in the concerts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so. so Nina. We, we won't go too much longer because I know you've got places to be, but I'm interested. You've had all of this success, but it's very much on like your, your, like your personal brand and you being the person involved, right? Would you sell? Would you be able to sell? What's your five year, I guess, plan with it all? This is the hard thing is I don't plan. Like I moved to Vancouver Island a month ago and I decided the day before I got here that I was going to do that. So like things are, I, I don't plan. I am chaos. That is how I operate. And I've accepted that. I don't think I would sell. Like, I think it's, to me, this is fun. This is what I enjoy doing. I think I would definitely adjust things. Like I have, I have to pull back a little bit from some stuff because I do just get so excited that I overcommit and I do 500,000 things and I am a people pleaser and so like anytime someone's like I didn't understand this I'm like let me just make you a two-hour video let's like that's fine and it's like whoa chill for a minute um so I think like I don't think I would sell it I think some of my blogs three of them I would and that's kind of a long-term goal if I ever like I don't think I've logged into one of them in six months <laughs> like it's not good um and I'm doing stuff wrong with them like it's it's sad because my name is like Type, not technically associated with it, but I guess it will be. Um, and they are embarrassingly bad because <laughs> I've just not touched them. So once I deal with those, I would sell those. But my biggest site, I love it. It's it's my thing. So I don't think I would sell maybe 10 years down the line. But my five-year plan is basically just keep doing what I'm doing. Like it's working. Um, I definitely want to keep experimenting and trying things. But I, the problem is in our world, things change so much in three months that like, Mm -hmm. what I plan for now, if I planned two years ago, I wouldn't have known AI was going to be a thing. I wouldn't have known so many things that are happening right now. Like everyone's panicked about SG and everything with Google, but like, we don't know anything about it. And if you ask like normal people, they're like, what is AI? Like, why would I care? Why would I want that? They're mostly afraid of it. Um, and so, yeah, so I don't think I have a plan, unfortunately, that would be helpful, but I feel like the plan is just keep trucking. And honestly, more of my planning is like, take care of Nina, the human and try to like prioritize my mental health and like taking breaks um, and planning more. Yeah, time off not being 
as addicted to my phone as I definitely am. Like there's a reason people are like, people will email me and like a question and I'll reply immediately. And they're like, what? <laughs> like I thought this would take three days. And I'm like, no, I am alone in the woods and obsessed with technology. So like I need to make some real life friends near me, I guess, and get off the phone once in a while. <laughs> Well, you deserve it, man. You've absolutely smashed it. And yeah. this has been yeah. an incredible conversation, packed full of value. I've loved every minute of it. Thank you so much. And where can people come find you? Where's your courses? And um, obviously, we'll throw all the, the important links in the show notes, of course. But yeah. Yeah, you can find me at sheknowsseo.co. And I'm at Nina Clapperton on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is probably the best place to find me. It's where I'm doing a lot right now. Uh, but you can also find my free Facebook group on Facebook, SEO for Travel Bloggers, which is where it's for everybody, not just travel bloggers. I just named it before I knew other people would be interested <laughs> in me. Uh, but on she, knows, on she Knows SEO, if you go sheknowsseo.co slash everything, you'll find absolutely everything I sell in one spot. Keeping it simple. Love it. Wicked. Yeah. Well, thank you, Nina. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Mm.